Welcome to Beating Cancer Daily. Beating stage four cancer for 30 years still takes my breath away every time I say it. I'm Saren, founder of the Comedy Cures Foundation, and I hope you'll join me for just a few minutes daily for the next 365 days so we may laugh, learn, maybe cry a little as we live our best days beating cancer daily together. So I have a beating cancer daily fan favorite back today. And you know that I love her. She makes me laugh. We have the best conversations. So I can't wait for Missy Hall, comedian Missy Hall, breast cancer survivor, Missy Hall, to be back on Beating Cancer Daily. So, hi, Missy. Hello, Saren. Hello, listeners. (laughs) I'm so happy to be here. (laughs) I get really excited because I get to relive the moments of what it feels like to be fresh out of cancer treatment And there were so many different emotions with that and so many different anxieties and fears and joys and celebrations. And so when we get to talk, it takes me right back to, what, two decades ago, almost two and a half decades ago when I was in your same situation. And it feels like yesterday. And I know that we get this opportunity to talk about this entire journey real time with you. And I'm just so honored to do it. And today, I know we have this yummy discussion that we want to have about time. And I call it cancer time because it's all different. (laughs) Missy's laughing (laughs) because it's a whole different universe after you've heard those words. You have cancer. <laughs> Those <laughs> chilling words. Time takes on a whole new value system. So how's it going for you, Missy? Right now, this moment is really good. It's really, really good. And I am learning to think of them as moments, like chunks of time in a row, because I'm never quite sure when I'm going to suddenly be exhausted or suddenly cry, and this moment feels good. Like I'm, I'm giggly and happy. You know? It's really interesting that you say that because you were very emotional on our last conversation that we had on Beating Cancer Daily. And if this is your first episode of Beating Cancer Daily, they're all so different. And Missy is one of the few guests that we have discussions with. But if this is your first Missy episode, I urge you to go back and listen to this incredible woman's journey that she's allowed us to record on Beating Cancer Daily. There are so many episodes and we take her through her entire beginning and middle and now end of treatment. And she is so authentic and so honest and so funny. And she also lets us follow her back on stage as a comedian, which is mind blowing to me and to our listeners based on all the feedback. So Missy, I'm so happy to hear that you have this perspective, which is that all these different emotions come out. And sometimes we feel like we can conquer the world during and after cancer treatment. And sometimes we feel like the world's so big and we just want to pull the covers over our heads. So (laughs) I am so happy that you're getting to experience this week more energy and more joy. Yeah, it feels good. You know how when you are feeling joy and happy, there's a warmth in your tummy. And a lot of times that's been replaced with either butterfly anxiety or just general malaise. And I was like, okay, today feels good. Like I am not on the verge of tears at this moment. I don't know that there won't be something tonight that triggers 
some flow of tears. I can't predict what's happening, but right now is good. <laughs> you know, that's also perimenopause, menopause, postmenopause. Oh my word. A lot of hormonal changes happening, especially with the medicine that you're on. So you don't know which part is pulling which emotion at what time. But what I love is that one, you're aware of it. And two, you're allowing yourself to experience everything that's really happening for you. That has been something that I've had to learn. I have been truly trying to sidestep any sadness and fear. I've been trying to act as if I'm plowing through, but then the feelings catch up. So my actions have been forward moving, but then sometimes those that fear or anxiety or grief just sneaks up on you. I, I think there's real mourning that happens. There's a real mourning process. And we have an episode called Cancer Pity Party. And if you haven't heard that episode, it's a real thing. And I really teach you how to incrementally mourn a lot of the trauma and drama that's happened with this diagnosis and treatment and survivorship. It's a really valuable, pivotal episode. So I just urge you to hear it if you haven't heard it. But Missy, we have to let them know if they haven't heard prior episodes. You went back on stage four days, four days after your surgery. You crazy woman. Like I did went back on a stage and did <laughs> headlining comedy. Do you realize how crazy that is? And no wonder you didn't have time to grieve or mourn because you were carrying an audience of people who paid to see you be funny. Yes. Yeah. I mean, that's the thing. There's a lot of responsibility, you know, with great laughter comes great responsibility. <laughs> we are talking like monumental, like this could be a governmental act. I know. But it, because I always see it, I, you know, people pay babysitters, they pay for tickets. There are people that found you out of a million different comics and was like, okay, let's use you. And I'm like, you have to bring it. And it just didn't occur to me not to do it. it yeah, but there's also financial pressures. You're out of gosh. work because you've had all this treatment and you don't want to turn down a gig because you don't want to get passed up by another headliner. Everyone's job is, you know, comes with a fear that when you're not there, it, it's it's very, very stressful. But when you're doing comedy, there's no shortage of comics. Nope. And I'm not that special. Nobody's going to be like, oh, well, we didn't get Missy. Well, we can't wait till the next time you're available. Like it, I'll just be off the radar. You can just disappear very, very quickly. And I know that sounds dramatic. I'm not trying to be dramatic. That's the reality of the job that I've chosen. Wait, so I need to explain one thing. And that is that a lot of comedy bookers, will only book one woman on a show and they'll book a lot of men, but it's very rare. You'll see a lot of women on a show together unless it's a woman's show. So to get that coveted spot, the female spot, and to lose that spot, sometimes it's really hard to get back in that position. So I really understand what you're saying, Missy, just from a comedy industry point of view. Right. And like I said, I'm not trying to be dramatic. It's just, it's real numbers. It's how it works. So I've been very well aware of that. In fact, when I first was diagnosed, one of my considerations as to whether or not I'd share it publicly was like, are people going to be afraid to hire me? Yeah, you know? because they could be like, oh, she's not going to be funny or she's going to make all her material about being on cancer treatment because it's relevant to her. And then what does the audience care about that? So I get it. I get the whole bias part. Right. So that was a huge consideration. And I needed I needed my life to 
stay as non-cancery as possible. We've all seen the cartoons of somebody with a head cold lying on a couch, but our man or a woman with cancer, like building a barn. Like we have to pretend that this is not happening. I'm still in here. Yeah. I totally agree with you. And I do know people who just literally pull the covers over their head and don't tell anyone, hide out and or pretend like they went away on vacation and then get through it all. And then when it's over, come back and sometimes never tell anybody. And we have an episode called Drive by Cancer, which is very much about people who choose that path. I think I've told the story before that when I met Carly Simon right after I was diagnosed, that's the advice that she gave me. And she was very adamant that that was the way she had chosen to do it. And she was going to wait to be public about it. And then, of course, she was public about it. So I'm not speaking out of turn. But personally, I thought that if I did that, that would kill me because I am such a social beast. I needed the socialization. I needed to talk about it. I needed to be very forward about it. And heck, I started the Comedy Cures Foundation from my chemo chair, my first chemo treatment. And I'm still talking about it after 24 years. So I, <laughs> I, <yeah. laughs> it's true. I think maybe we're seeing that some of us are destined to give it a voice, a big voice, while others are destined to handle it a different way. Yeah. And there's no judgment and there's no right or wrong. This is such a personal choice and such a personal way to handle it. But just in terms of time, I became fanatical about not delaying anything. And it's been 24 years. And since I've started my first cancer treatment, 30 years since I was misdiagnosed and 21 years since I was considered no evidence of disease and then in remission. And I am telling you, when they said, get your affairs in order, you have less than five years to live. Nothing was delayed. If I thought of something, I did it. If it was a good deed, I did it. If it was something I wanted to do on vacation, I did it. If it was a meal I wanted to have, I had it. Instant gratification (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> took on a whole new meaning. And I'm still doing it that way. I, and it's been a very long time. But that for me was cancer time. And everybody's like, you do so many things in a day. Like if ever you want something done, give it to Saren. And I'm like, because I'm on cancer time. <laughs> it's so, it's the strangest thing. Because again, I was so blessed from early on my prognosis was good because of the type of cancer cells I had. They're like, oh, we know what to do with these. So right away, I had the sense of knowing that I was going to be okay. What I didn't realize, honestly, is how much it was going to change time in my head. I mentioned cancer. I was like, yeah, well, this just think this time last year when this all started, I'm like, This didn't even start. This started in February. This was six months ago. In my mind, this has been around a lot longer. All right. I just want to say there's BC and AC, and we are not talking religious. It is before cancer and after cancer. I know you document life like that, right? Yep, I do. I do. In fact, I even wrote a blog on it on my Facebook page because it is, I was cleaning out my closet. My, a dear friend of mine who's far more organized than I came over and was helping me do stuff. And I was like, okay, I feel like I went through these sweaters. I was like, well, wait a minute. I haven't, that was before cancer. And then we were doing it. And I was like, well, I haven't worn this since before cancer. Like everything was that marker. I went to a comedy club. I'm like, oh my gosh, I haven't been here since before the cancer. (laughs) I keep... (laughs) Missy, I love how you gave it an article. The cancer. It's like the Facebook. I know. (laughs) Yes, the Facebook. You know, the Twitter, the Facebook, (laughs) the cancer. This was before the cancer. And I... (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> oh, no, that just that makes me laugh before yeah. the cancer. Okay. Yeah, it, it sounds right. Right. It gives it. And 
it's been so strange. Sometimes it's been funny and sometimes it's broken my heart when I've said it because there's a, there's like, why does time feel like it was so long ago? Like, why do I not remember what it felt like before the cancer? Like, why don't I remember that? Well, you have no excuse of having chemo brain girl. No. Yeah. No. And this is scary, Saren, because right now I can forget what I'm doing while I'm doing it. Like, I think the medication that I'm on has stripped estrogen. I'm on an estrazole and my, so all of my estrogen is gone. So I think is this menopause brain? I I don't know what it is, but it's very strange. How about post-traumatic stress brain? It's true. Do you know the most glorious thing? I had an appointment just this, just past week, a follow-up with the radiation doctor. How are you healing, by the way? How is your skin healing? Very well. I, yes, very, very well. Oh, thank God. When she looked, she was very impressed. I'm also, I'm very fair skinned. And she's like, this is amazing. And I'm like, well, I've rubbed aloe plants. <laughs> like everything that could be done has been done. But when I was asking her, I'm like, I still feel very fatigued. I feel weepy. And and the hot flashes, they don't feel like hot flashes. They feel like you're getting the flu. And I was so grateful that she said, honey, honey, honey. She's like, you're still going to feel the radiation three to six months after. She's like, right now you've got the double whammy with the anestrozole. She's like, you know, your doctor sees you, your oncologist sees you six months after you start that to make sure you can still take it. Like it's not easy on your system. And this is still new. And she used PTSD. She's like, just even being here, I had to go see her in the very place where I went for my radiation treatments every day. And I could feel myself like deep breathing in the parking lot and going through. She's like, I love that she acknowledged that immediately. You know, that's a thing. She's like, this is all just come at you. We've everybody, you feel like everybody in the hospital has, has messed around with you. She's like, it, it's what you're feeling is very, very common, which a lot of times when somebody tells you something is to be expected or not a red flag for anything scary, it makes it feel a little bit better. Just back to the comment you said about hot flashes feeling like the flu. I used to call them power surges. (laughs) (laughs) Because all of a sudden I would just be like, okay. And then my whole body would just feel like there was a complete surge of power. So I called them power surges, which made me laugh. I I like that. I may have to adopt that. You got it. Yeah, thank you. I'll credit you. <laughs> I know. <laughs> Before cancer, I was having normal a stage of perimenopausal, menopausal hot flashes. And I would look at my husband. I'd be like, look at my head, touch my head. And he got to the point where he's like, I'm, I don't, I don't <laughs> want to touch your head. Like, it, I don't <laughs> want to. Now that they're magnified, he will look at me and go, oh my gosh, it's happening. I can see it. I'm like, I know. Now I'm laughing about it in the middle of the night when it's waking me up and I'm soaking wet. It's not so funny. I get it. I get it. Just And it, back to this concept of time. Yes. I do feel that it really has helped me prioritize my life in such an interesting way. I was pretty fearless before I got cancer, but after beating stage four cancer, I've become incredibly fearless and will try and do anything. I've done an entire episode on it called Cancer Fearless. How do you feel in terms of priorities? Are there things that you would never have tried or put on the back burner that now you want to put at the forefront of your life? Some of the things I have a new grand, well, he's not new and he's 10 months old, but I don't put off any moment that I can spend with him. 
I don't put off the things that actually will keep me healthy. Like I used to talk a good game about exercising or trying to eat well, but it would be tomorrow, tomorrow, tomorrow. And that has become a huge priority. And littler things like I'm, my focus has almost gotten smaller instead of bigger career wise. I am no longer afraid to try anything and put myself out there in terms of around my house. My focus is getting smaller, you know, instead of rushing through the day, I will go sit outside in the backyard with the dogs and just stare at them. So I'm being far more intentional with time. Intentionality with time, I think, is one of the biggest blessings that cancer can give. It really helps you think about your life, what your priorities are, what you want to focus on, and what you're going to make time for, and what you want to do. And it's an episode that we did called The Living List, which... Mm -hmm more people think about in terms of a bucket list, but my friend made me call it the living list. If you haven't heard that episode, it's a really good episode about setting your goals and living the best life possible with most intentionality about what you want to achieve and do in whatever time you have here. It could be decades and it could be days, but just really focused on on what will make you happy and feel fulfilled. It's funny. I thought that my list of of things would be bigger. This, at this particular chapter, so fresh out of it, my list is smaller. And that feels good. I, again, I'm sure that's going to ebb and flow like everything else has. I just want to say that's so beautiful. What you said just so impacted my heart because my list was huge. I was very young and I was a young mom and my list was incredibly long and very detailed. And now I see because it's decades later, I think my list would be smaller too. Mm -hmm. Well, and you were still actively parenting. You had a little girl that you thought you were going to be cheated out of, right? And you thought she was going to be cheated out of you. That's a very different, it's a different stage, but I have only been married to the man of my dreams for five years. I did just become a grandmother and I'm seeing my daughter come into her own. There was a time that I think Missy Hall, like, what is she going to do? What if with all of this would have been bigger than I'm so happy to sit and laugh with my husband? He's a comedian. He's a comedian. If you haven't heard Missy talk about her husband in a prior episode, and they have a live Facebook date that you can be part of on Tuesday nights where you get to see two comedians kind of just hanging out, living life and talking. Yeah. And and it's so much fun. And I'm not to sound dark, but sometimes I look at them and I'm like, one day, one of us isn't going to be here. And however, whenever that's how life goes. And this has made that more evident to me. It was always just a theory before then that when this happened, I was like, ah, oh, this is what it feels like to get information that can be that life changing. And it has just changed that. You know what else is strange is there's fewer, there's fewer ways to scare me now. Like I have always been terrified of spiders there was one right beside my face on my kitchen wall. I was like, ah. like, I just, I was like, I would have screamed. I would have been, I would have flipped out. I would have been adrenaline filled for days. And I was just like, okay. It just didn't, I didn't feel it the way I used to. I'm like, you really can't scare me now. 
I just was thinking about what you just said about five years married with the man of your dreams and how when you get married to somebody later in life, because I'm in the similar situation in terms of another marriage, right? And how time feels so different in a later marriage than it does in the first marriage. And after a cancer diagnosis, how different time feels. Yes. It's this weird, I'm right now I'm having a vision of like an accordion, like in my twenties and thirties, it was all stretched out. Now I feel like everything's got to be compressed. Like mathematically, we're not going to have a 50 year anniversary. You know what I mean? We're not, it's not going to happen. So I'm feeling like I got to squeeze all of the love and meaning in now. And that's just math. That's honest life expectancy of very healthy people. And now that I'm older and know what I'm doing more and this chapter, and you're probably experiencing it too, like, oh my gosh, this is the person I'm supposed to do life with. So you feel almost this pressure, like we got to do this. You know? Yeah, that's real. I know <laughs> I wrote some tumor humor about how once you're diagnosed, you just want to have these big experiences. And at first you could just really go crazy swimming with dolphins, you know, <laughs> bungee jumping, <laughs> like yeah. flame throwing. I don't know. Right. It, it just can get really funny where you just try to compress a lot of crazy experiences in to one part of your life. I, I'm so curious how you feel about time. Are you experiencing time in a different way since you were diagnosed or a different way since they said you were in remission? How are you using time? What does it feel like? If you want to tell us, you can go to comedycures.org and hit the record button and just let us know or hit the contact button and write to us about it. It's such a personal thing, and I'm always so curious how people do it. I read an incredible concept about time, and it's written in a workbook that I read by a teacher and rabbi, Simon Jacobson, and the analysis he has of time from a Jewish perspective is that time is circular, not linear. Missy's like what? freaking out. I, I, you can't see her face, but she just had like her brains just went, yep. they like let off a bunch of smoke. It did. Yeah. It- I have to send you this analysis because I often quote different religious sources here. I happen to be Jewish. So maybe there's a little more Jewish sources that I quote, but it doesn't matter if you're Jewish or not. Jewish. It doesn't matter if you're religious or not religious. This just has to do with different concepts that I think get us all thinking. It doesn't matter if you are that religion or not. The first time I read a circular concept of time, it blew my mind. And what it taught me was that you can always seek forgiveness. You can always do something better because you get second chances in life. And I think cancer is a perfect example of that. It gives us a redo because it wakes us up. And in a lot of ways, it's a blessing at times because it can push to the forefront apologies that you have to give, forgiveness that you have to give, or just put fire under your butt to achieve something or prioritize something like you are, which is family, husband, grandchildren. And that's what cancer does. It's a wake up call and it really gets you to look at time in a different way. It, it absolutely does. And do you know what else it has taken away, which I think is the blessing, like a good blessing is comparing myself to others 
does my career match up here or what is the no the things that have fallen away are the things that I don't, however you see God, I don't think are the things that God ever wanted me to carry around with me, right? And that part, like you said, there are blessings that come with it. And that is one of mine. But the the time as a circle, it's just even a more comforting image. In Here, your here's another element to that. That there are different times of year that have different energy. Mm. And because it's a circular concept of time, you have different times within the months that you feel more energized, where you feel more hopeful, where you feel more elated, where you feel more drained. And that blew my mind because I started watching how my energy levels were as the months went on and which months I felt more energized in and which months I felt like I needed a recharge. And that was really powerful for me because then I knew that I could start using universal energy to help me propel certain things forward that were more monumental in terms of goals that I wanted to achieve. It's just a brilliant, it's a brilliant analysis. And it is by this rabbi named Simon Jacobson, who's a prolific teacher and writer. I've actually mentioned him before because he has perfect auditory memory. So he can hear hours worth of lectures and then he can write it down and capture it verbatim. Wow. Wow. Yeah, he's pretty special person. He's he actually became a friend. But I just love this and I constantly read this analysis of time because it just makes so much sense to me. I've never felt the world or anything was linear. Well, we proved that the world was round a long time ago. But <laughs> what? <laughs> but but I've never felt that way. I I've always felt that Everything around me was very circular. I don't like hard edges. I like roundness. Are you thinking about how to use your interest in time now on stage? Are you working on any material about time? I am. I am thinking about different time. Like there's time that kind of stands still. Like when you're a mom. When they're a toddler, you'll think, okay, well, we've done flashcards, we've read some books, we've played with toys, boy, the day's got to be almost over, and you'll look at your watch, and it's 9.45 a.m., right? (laughs) And I want to write some jokes about all of that time that felt so stretched out. I'd like to add it on to the stuff that's moving too fast, And I haven't gotten the specifics yet, but I think coming up with examples where time is just drawn out to then when it gets crunched up would be funny. I think that would resonate like the hours spent in algebra class that were days. Those those hours were days. It's so great. When you work out this routine, you definitely have to share it with us first. And I just know that I used to run chronically late and I made a commitment not to run late and I'm doing really well with it. And it's, well, I'm not going to even justify it because that would be wrong. My daughter would say that it's because when people stop me or call me and they want to talk about their cancer or their trauma, I will stop and I will make that person my universe And then I'm not aware of time and then I get off schedule and I run late, but I'm not going to justify it. It's just how it used to be. And now I'm really being very conscious about time and I got to watch and I set a lot of alarms so that I really try to run on time. But people used to call it sarin time. Oh, oh, oh. Because Saren time meant that there was no on-time behavior. And I didn't like that. 
So I've really made it a priority, especially because my husband runs early and his whole family runs early. So if you are not somewhere a half an hour early, you are late. Yep. I'm, I've always functioned that way. Super early. I have a friend that teases me about my promptness and I I don't see that changing, but I think the pressure that I'm putting on myself for other deadlines, like, oh my God, well, I'm creating a new website, right? I'm like, that's got to be done this week. I'm like, it really doesn't. The world is not going to stop spinning if I don't have a new website this week. That is a cancer lesson. Yes. That really changes. Those pressures really adjust, at least for me, they adjusted. Absolutely. They absolutely have. I love you, girl. And I know the Beating Cancer Daily world loves you. We have listeners all over the world. And the feedback when they see that you are coming on an episode and they get to hear another installment of you and your life as a comedian and as a survivor of cancer now they just eat it up. So you have to promise me that you'll come back again. I absolutely will. This really does mean the world to me. And you know, I love you right back. I love that there are people enjoying hearing us and our conversations. Like it's just, the world needs light. Yeah. And it's, it just feels good. I am so happy to share Missy's contact information with you. If you go to comedycures.org and you just contact us, we will send you her signature so you can jump on her Facebook show on Tuesday nights and be part of her world outside of beating cancer daily. And if Missy is going to be in your area, definitely go see her on stage because she's so animated and so fun. And I just feel like you will have a wonderful time. Missy, bless you. Thank you so much, sweetheart. And I'll talk to you soon. Thank you so much. See you tomorrow. If you've enjoyed this podcast, then I'd love to ask for you to go to comedycures.org and check out our membership circle levels. You will find even more resources and more programming like our live virtual Q&A sessions with me, our live Comedy Cures events with our very talented comedians, live health builder workshops with Jackie Bryan hosted by me, a robust monthly newsletter, plus much more. It's really an exciting community. So please consider becoming a member, giving it as a gift, telling your friends, telling your hospital support group all about this community. I can't think of a more empowering way to go through a cancer journey or your survivorship or your caregiving experience than with us at Beating Cancer Daily. It's truly an honor to serve you. Thanks so much. See you tomorrow. Guess what time it is? It's time for me to read the disclaimer. Beating Cancer Daily and the Membership Circle are not in lieu of medical advice or treatment. They are for entertainment purposes only. Please consult your healthcare team to review your best strategy. Thanks for listening.